constantly observing change here in our great city of Melbourne as well as other cities in Australia and, and overseas. Uh, a lot of my personal projects are drawn out of aesthetic intrigue. I'm drawn to subject matter that's strong, bold and graphic. And there's a common thread through these subject matters that um, have a direct relationship with environment and climate, whether that be cause or effect. Some of my artistic inspirations, Ed Rusher, Jeffrey Smart, Andreas Gursky, Ed Batinsky, They've all depicted through their work their surrounds as source material for aesthetic enjoyment, but each in their own way have also depicted stories that tell a greater significance about our footprint on the planet within our time. I'm not a climate expert in any capacity. Um, I come from no scientific background. I'm just a concerned citizen of the world. Um, and what uh, we're going to look at a few pictures today that um, demonstrate uh, some local concerns and. Um, some, some work that I've done overseas. So I'm delighted to speak about a topic that's so relevant today and a topic that needs a constant audience reminder. Um, in my work practice, I photograph a lot of built environment, whether that's for architects or uh, developers, design firms, the brief view usually revolves around the hero image or postcard shot. So this image here of Melbourne was shot pretty recently, only a couple of months ago, in a helicopter. Um, is, that, is that clear? Does that need some focus? Um, what, it, what it looks at really is depicting Melbourne as a pretty place to live, aesthetically pleasing, green environment, it's a nice blue water, blue clear sky. And as Melburnians, you know, we, we think of our city as a nice place to live and we take a pretty proud view of it overall. If we were to look at the anti-hero image from the other side of town, and not picking on anyone from the west here. Uh, but when we see industrial sort of facilities in our city, we don't really focus too much select interest on it. It's not a pretty view. Here's also, this is up in the helicopter, this is the Dandenong shrouded in smog. This is only two months ago. The immediate weather concerns and climate affects my work. We took up this day, that's on the same day, over Caulfield Racecourse looking back toward the city. And again, we can see out west, it's pretty, pretty smoggy and bleak. Um, we landed the helicopter that day because commercial concerns, we couldn't actually show that sort of postcard shot of Melbourne. So the smog levels are on the rise as the city grows. Uh, what we don't want to end up looking like, obviously, is something in China. That's, that's a clearer depiction of an image that I could find from um, some time I spent in China. Uh, the sky is not blue, but we can see the buildings. 
this image here is a more prevalent picture of the smog there. This is in Beijing. It's pretty bleak part of the world. It'd be hard to live in. It's hard to hard, be hard to breathe the air over there. And we're certainly hoping Melbourne doesn't get to this level where we have to photograph our buildings that look like that, where you can barely see them. Uh, a client recently asked me if to make the smog look like fog um, and get some atmospheric results, which I don't believe that you can. This is actual fog, which is sort of similar to this morning's fog. Um, the particles obviously in the air are different in fog. It's moisture particles com compared to the poisonous sort of um, toxins that, that smog would present. Again, that's from the same, the same series. Actually, I'll just click back onto this image here. I don't know if it's too visible uh, with the lighting here, but it, there's about 17, um, 17 cranes, I think, I've noticed in that photograph. And we all know that Melbourne's a city that's growing very rapidly. Um, we're set to overtake Sydney as Australia's biggest city by 2053 with a population forecast of about 8 million people in 40 years. Currently just over 4 million people. That's close to doubling it within 40 years. So the natural effects of um, more cars on the road is only going to increase the smog levels. The, the growth of expansion, it, it's, it's just a short drive to Geelong down the Princess Freeway and I think um, before too long, it's not a matter of when but, uh, or, or if but when, uh, Geelong becomes an outer suburb of Melbourne with the expansion of this um, housing, uh, over 13,500 homes are under construction are due for completion over the next three years. For the suburbs, you know, the great Australian dream of having a big house and a big backyard seems to have diminished somewhat with the backyard sense. Um, <laughs> There's no real room in these properties for kicking a footy or backyard cricket. But the footprint of the house is still quite big. They're, they all talk about square meterage and we all need a big house that has a lot of square metres. On all of these houses we see air conditioning units. So the bigger the house, the more air conditioning and the more energy we're going to use to try to create a pleasant and temperate environment within them for ourselves. And of course all suburbs need some resemblance of a lake to remind us that there's water nearby. <laughs> <laughs> so these suburbs uh, are expanding extremely quickly um, to, fill, to fill the housing market needs that we have in Melbourne as a growing city. This image shows that there are more solar panels starting to happen but it's still very slow. It's only, uh, what have we got, one or two in every, in every six. Um, rooftops here that we can see it. Solar power in Australia only produces 1.62% of the country's total electricity generation, um, which is a very small percent for a country that's so big and has so much sunshine. Uh, about 1.25 million small-scale solar systems were installed by the end of 2013, meaning approximately 3.1 million Australians now live or work beneath a set of solar panels, which is an improving sign, but it's still not rapid enough. Here we can see the land getting cleared just to build more and more and the encroachment line of the suburbs in what used to be prime farming land. This is the Altona refinery, just 13 k's outside of Melbourne CBD. Again, probably what you'd call an anti-hero shot. Um, it's not uh, what you'd, how you'd try to depict Altona Beach if you're trying to sell Altona Beach. Uh, we see houses sitting on the edge here on the fringe. Um, this refinery operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Processes crude oil into the full range of petroleum products. This, uh, the refinery produces up to 13 million litres of refined fuel products per day, which is enough to fill more than 300,000 cars which is half of Victoria's fuel needs. Petrol represents 60% of the production, diesels a further 30% and jet fuels around 10%. I feel sometimes witnessing and observing these sort of areas 
with the smoke and things, you can sort of, we've all moved through those areas at some point, you can sort of taste that acrid sort of smell in your nostrils. It's not a pleasant environment to, to be around. Australia's import and export total over a two year period of uh, oil and petroleum is 57 million mass tonnes. That's a lot of oil. This is a more presentable image of the oil industry where we're much more likely to see our petrol stations and service stations as beacons of light in the, in the landscape where we can just cleanly and quickly fill our cars and move on down the road to the next destination. So we're a nation of car lovers. Uh, these are new cars just sitting down on the docks waiting to be purchased. Um, in 2014, we've sold over a million and a hundred thousand new cars. And seven times in the past eight years, Australians have bought more than a million cars in a calendar year. So two and a quarter million cars in the last two years have been sold. And there's just literally field lots of these cars waiting for purchase. Bio, diesel, hybrid and electric cars, um, we're still waiting for broader mass market saturation of these types of vehicles away from the traditional fuel sources. And obviously the old cars have all got to end up somewhere, whether they're pick apart lots or just sitting on someone's land. Our ports are extremely busy. Victoria's port equates for over a third of Australia's container traffic that gets shipped around the nation each year. 66 and a half million tonnes of consumable goods move around. So these pictures act as a reminder really of broader consumerism. Now, whether they're shipping new cars, our clothes, our chemist goods, um, stuff for the $2 shop, there's a lot of it moving around. We're moving it on trains and across the boats. The maritime fuel emissions are exceedingly high and, and attribute for a large percentage, I think it's about 17% of the world's global emissions of just having ships moving around everywhere. We're a major um, resources exporter. One of, the, one of the biggest exporters of iron ore and coal. Coal in Australia is mined primarily in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. It's used to generate electricity and 54% of the coal mined in Australia is exported, mostly to Eastern Asia. Coal still provides around 85% of Australia's electri ele <laughs> electrical production. Again, a staggering number. Uh, in 2010, we're, we're still the fourth largest coal producer after China, the US and India. And in terms of proportion of production exported, Australia's the largest coal exporter as it exports roughly 70% of coal production. The burning of coal produces 42.1% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions, which excludes the export coal, of which we're shipping out 70% of what we pull out of the ground. It still, it still maintains to be the second largest source of export, inco export income after iron ore. That's why in Australia we seem to be so slow to adopt greener and cleaner technologies because there's so much money involved because we actually have this resource under the earth. Can I take you now across the other side of the world to Iceland where we can see direct causes or direct effects from global warming. Um, I'll start out by saying I went there to look at doing a personal project again from an aerial perspective of the frozen river series over there. What we're looking at here is 
an ice river. We see the formations of ice there. These rivers melt from the glaciers, the water trickles down, and they create these amazing patterns in the earth. So I went there for aesthetic reasons to capture and document images like this. But what I found was um, a little bit of a bigger story when we, when we move on to the glaciers. So areas like this are predicted around the 2100 mark to p potentially not being around anymore. This is frozen ice formations, just in a big sort of river series. The, um, the, texture that we, the texture that you're seeing there is sort of trapped air bubbles within the ice structures as more water trickles across it and, uh, and then refreezes again and again. You can imagine it's quite a beautiful and special place to visit and to see through, with, with your own eyes. I felt extremely lucky to get there and extremely lucky to be able to um, facilitate uh, a small aircraft and um, to fly to these regions to document this part of the world. This was the first time I saw a glacier. This one was called the Lang Yokel Glacier. Uh, it was quite overwhelming, being from Melbourne, Australia, I'd not yet seen a glacier. And um, when I arrived there, getting the sense of scale from an aerial perspective was quite overwhelming. Now, the glaciers are retreating and receding and melting very rapidly. This tongue of the glacier through the mountains, I don't know if it's quite evident through here. I don't have a laser pointer, but it used to run much further and closer around the ridge of that mountain. You can just see a little line if you look closely, but I can't see it from here. I don't know if it's <laughs> evident from back there. Everywhere on Earth, the ice is changing. According to NASA, the polar ice caps now melting at the alarming rate of 9% per decade. The Arctic ice thickness has decreased 40% since the 1960s. And Arctic summers could be ice free by 2040 and sea levels could rise as much as 23, inch, 23 inches by the year 2100 if current warming patterns continue. So these glaciers are hundreds of thousands, if not toward millions of years old. They're formed with layer upon layer of snow freezing and freezing on top of each other. And they still look cavernous, really quite massive. These crevices, they just drop down for a long, long way. That happens to be the top of a volcano where the glaciers in Iceland sit over the volcano tops. We saw that one in 2010, the unpronounceable word, um, caused the air traffic problems. That wasn't this particular one, but it's not far away. So whilst the glaciers melt, th this place is called Jokulsalen Glacial Lagoon. And here you can see the glacier receding and melting where the ice fragments off and chips away in what's called carving and these massive chunks of ice break away and eventually drift out into the sea. It's quite a mesmerising place to sit by the edge of this lagoon. I sat there for a day taking photographs and just watching and listening and the sound of the ice creaking and cracking melting away is, is quite powerful. There's no other sounds around apart from the wind. And these huge chunks of ice just fragment off. There's a very slight reference of scale in this photograph that back beyond there, there's a few power lines if you strain your eyes and look right towards the top of the, top of the screen there. Very large power lines that are covering a big, big area. These are huge chunks of ice. Here there, here's the beach just that was next to that, um, near that bridge where the ice chunks just wash up. 
on the black sand, they, they look really quite beautiful, like diamonds washing up. We can see some people at the top of the image there, standing on the beach. That's something I didn't want to see from the aircraft. <laughs> uh, I think I've got the next slide. Um, the pilot <laughs> started alarmingly saying, shut the window, let's, let's get out of here. We've got about, he said, we have six to seven minutes left of fuel. I said, how far is it till we land? And he said, maybe six to seven minutes, depending on wind. Um, I thought, if we're going to go down, it was a pretty, uh, pretty nice <laughs> view to have as a final view in that area. I mean, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Fortunately, the wind didn't um, blow too strongly. So on the beach, here's, here's the ice freshly broken off the glacier, melted down somewhat. They're very sculptural, somewhat architectural. I think this one looks like two birds sitting on a nest of eggs. There is really something quite beautiful in the, in the blue glacial ice. It, it's, it's captivating to look at. It floats along in the waterway. Obviously, from my time being there, all these ice chunks don't, don't remain. Fresh ones would have been washed up again as that glacier retreats along. Being pounded by the waves. Wasn't expecting to see <laughs> an extreme surfer going out to brave the elements out there. Um, I think he had pretty thick wetsuits on. You see the waves crunching into those huge chunks of ice. If he came off his board, you wouldn't want to be um, face planting into any sort of ice and knocking yourself unconscious in those waters. I got my legs wet trying to take photographs and it was pretty cold water. These guys, they did a great, <laughs> they were pretty good though. Um, I think they were there filming a, some sort of surf film and they seemed to have a great time. I didn't see them come off and hit any part of the ice. But the reminder that um, these, these parts of the world are changing and hopefully not as rapidly as all the forecasts predict, but as citizens and as consumers, you know, we need to remind ourselves that you know, we need to turn our lights off, we need to drive less and um, consume less as, as we move through our lives and um, leave a better place for those ahead. So I think that was the last slide. So thanks for having me and um, I'll leave you with that. So we have some time for some questions. I, I guess I'll just open it up, Tom. Um, I guess in terms of the things that you've seen, like you, you can kind of say for some of you kind of like photographs and documents, avatars that might kind of force them to make some changes in their life in terms of how they consume food and things like that. How has your practice and, and this kind of set of imagery had an effect in your personal and professional life? Um, well, it affects me in terms of I, I'm the sort of person who walks down the road half a k to put my coffee cup in a recycle bin and turn lights off and turn the PowerPoints off at home. Uh, professionally, there, I think for a lot of people there, you know, there's some moral questions that could get asked if approached by a mining company, for example, to take images for them, that you could run through the, well, do I want to be paid by this company to put their product forward or not? Um, but then at the same time, it's also some form of documentation of what is happening on the earth and yeah, they're, they're, they're interesting questions. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that I'd uh, walk away from it completely because I might take a different viewpoint, but it's certainly something you'd have to consider quite carefully. It definitely poses a lot of questions. Does anyone have any questions or want to chat about anything with Tom? Up back? Yes, in the Iceland series, what inspired you to go there? It seems to be I had, yeah, and I'd heard about these. Um, frozen rivers and I thought they were sort of quite beautiful and 
as I'm in the air a lot taking aerial perspectives, I wanted to get there to, to, to look at that perspective of those parts of the world and to create somewhat, I guess, from my end, <laughs> these swirling river patterns and, uh, of the frozen ice, you know, somewhat a photographic example of you know, a Jackson Pollock painting of, of the natural world, so to speak. Yeah, I'd love to go to Greenland. That's where the that's where the big ice sheets are, and um, a lot a lot more uh, in terms of scale. The that the Greenland ice sheet is the big one that they're all concerned about because it provides for the Earth in so many ways. But with with the speed at which it's melting, seeing those big icebergs drift away, that would be quite powerful, I think. Any other questions? No? Yeah. Yep. Well, I'll Just uh, when you were at high school, did you go there with like the environmental focus in mind, or did you just go there for the place and then sort of find that later? Yeah, that's right. I did find that later. I went there initially for the aesthetics. It's a naturally beautiful place in the world, described by many photographers as a photographer's dream. The landscapes are insanely beautiful everywhere we look. Um, but having witnessed firsthand, when you see and sit and listen to this, this ice just chipping away and melting, the environmental impact really hits home from that point. Any more? Yep. Have you seen the sort of the anti euro shots that you take? Have you seen them sort of have the impact that you want or raise enough discussion or are they used in a way that you feel being able to? I think with further broadcasts, I mean, even just having people look at them today, it's, they're the sort of things where we see and project such a pretty image of ourselves that we, we also need a reminder of the other angles and the other elements. And that, I guess, in essence, the, the more it's viewed, the more we can think about you know, these dirtier elements of how we live and, and just be reminded of that, that we, that we need to keep... Um, the future in mind. So are you sort of, in a way, campaigning with these like anti-hero shots showing the other side of what people normally could see through stock photography? And I would hope so, to some degree, yeah. I think, I think it's, uh, climate is such a, a big topic that's so relevant for everyone at the moment and it just needs pointers and reminders along the way and I guess my position is just as an observer. I've been fortunate in, to be in many positions in boats or helicopters in funny places and strange places and you observe some parts of the world like this and um, I think the pictures can inform an audience so for people who don't necessarily see that viewpoint they just serve as a reminder really. Cool. Thanks very much Tom. Let's give another hand to Tom for a Thank you. Thank you.